Okay, everybody, uh, welcome to our uh, off night here, select board meeting on Tuesday, September 4th. Due to the Memorial Day holiday, it kind of skipped us into. Uh, uh, Labor Day, not Memorial Day. Uh, I'm sorry, Labor Day, yeah. I'm wishing it was Memorial Day. <laughs> yeah. So, um, call a meeting to order. Uh, Skip, are you? No. Okay. Um, first thing to do then uh, is to approve the agenda. Is there any changes or additions? I'll make the uh, motion that we approve the agenda as presented. Okay. Second, Second that. Uh, all those in favor, say aye. 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 All right, consent agenda items, uh, minutes from the August 6th meeting, and uh, to appoint the municipal manager as a voting delegate to the Vermont League of the City and Ta Towns annual meeting. Take a motion to uh, approve a consent agenda. I'll make a motion to approve the consent agenda. I'll second that. Okay. Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Aye. And the public. Anybody wish to speak from the public at this point? Yeah, go ahead, Bill. Yeah, I just have one. Um, I just have one um, information for the public. Uh, the installation of the art on the railroad trestle or railroad bridge, it's not a trestle, that was supposed to uh, happen two Sundays ago, I think, mm -hmm. uh, had to be postponed. There was a glitch in the paperwork from the railroad, so the permit was not issued. Uh, it's been rescheduled for this Sunday, September 9th. Same uh, thing as before, 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. They don't think it will take that long, but all the same detours that we talked about the last time uh, will be in place. So just for your information, it will be this Sunday installing the art on the bridge. That's the route. So they were on, a little unsure as to a couple of, of uh, Traffic issues and, and yeah, but you got that all figured out. Straightened out, okay. everything's been squared away. All right. And I promise there'll be not a glitch, but <laughs> you know, it's been. And that one. If Bill would speak into the mic. You need batteries. I can't. It never works. <laughs> so I'm not even going to bother turning it on. The batteries must last 30 minutes. Well, if you're lucky. Okay. Anybody else from the public? All right. Seeing none at this point, we'll move on to a uh, presentation of the draft number two of the municipal plan update by the Planning Commission. Mr. Lop's speech. What are these for? And Mr. Bell. What are these for? I thought this was picked up in the end. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. She doesn't want you to feel left out. Okay. Because. I didn't trust the sound. Got the coffees here for everybody. Should I pass this along? So, so, no, I, I'll just pass them out. It's a meaty plan. Thank you. Yeah, I've got a timeline that I'm passing out. So if one of you pass the timelines down, that would be easier. More of that damn homework. Yeah. yeah. I think there's enough. Uh, yeah. Here we go. I got a couple more. Okay. Good. Uh, let's see. Do you have one? No. Can you share? We can share. Yeah, that'd be great. I didn't frame quite enough. Oh, okay. 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 There's one extra copy here. You want to return one? Do in too many trees, so if anybody wants to grab it, you're welcome. Do you have one anyway? Thank 
Ken? Ready, Ken. Okay, great. Um, hi, I'm Ken Bello. I'm the chair of the Planning Commission. And um, uh, we are here with Steve tonight, and Eric Gross, who's also from the Planning Commission, who's come to transmit to you the draft of the update to the municipal plan. So this is a five-year update of the plan as required by Vermont state law. Um, this will be the last of our five-year required updates because the statute has now been changed and um, we'll go to an eight-year cycle. So the five-year cycle is, um, um, I've, I've worked as a professional planner in four different states and I've never seen it done like this any other place other than Vermont. So I'm sure there's a reason for it, um, but we won't do it anymore. We'll do it on an eight-year cycle. Um, in this particular update, our goal was to not reinvent the wheel, as it were, or do a comprehensive rewrite. So five years ago, back in 2013, we did some pretty extensive outreach, community survey, some public meetings, things of that sort, and our goal was much more ambitious at that time. It was also an opportunity to utilize the, the data that came from the 2010 census, which was relatively fresh at that moment in time. And that's the time it makes sense to update all that data, which should be part of what's being looked at in, in terms of what's going to drive the plan. So we didn't really, we didn't do that this time. Our primary intent was to update the plan to include two new required elements that were required by the state legislature since 2013. Um, so one has to do with forest fragmentation. So in the report that was handed out to you, this two-page report, I think it's right in the front, um, if you go to page two, starting about halfway down, there's a bullet point list of things that identify where the specific updates in general to the plan were. So when we talk about forest fragmentation, it, it appears in multiple chapters in the plan. So um, you'll, you'll see a number of things that are related to that. Now the other has to do with energy planning. So um, because of changes in state law, Waterbury, like other municipalities in the state, have an opportunity to have an energy plan that can be viewed by the Public Service Board um, when some applicant goes in to site, whether it's a, a wind facility or some large-scale solar facility, um, the, the things within our town plan can be given what's called substantial deference. Um, precisely what that is, not exactly sure, uh, but it's more than what it was before. So that was part of our goal, was to um, include some information in the plan that would um, give us some additional um, leverage and standing um, with the Public Service Board um, and also with, with um, Act 250 and Act 250 procedures. Um, now, as part of the, the process, we had, you know, we had a lot of public meetings and various people showed up, and there was a certain amount of um, what I'd call mission creep. It wasn't necessarily our intention to update some various sections in the plan, but, but um, we got some input. People wanted some of the data, for example, in the local economy section to be updated. So we did that. So we updated some of that, that information. But it really didn't include, we weren't rewriting what the goals and objectives of the plan. We were trying to put some fresh, um, some fresh data um, in that. Um, the other thing is that since 2013, um, the village government has been dissolved. And so we had all kinds of references all littered throughout the plan between um, Waterbury Village as a separate government and the town of Waterbury as a separate government. Well, that distinction no longer exists. So um, there was some language, you know, Bill, Bill provided some updated language for us to talk about some of the things structurally that have taken place since, uh, since those events, I guess really last, last year, and now we're all big one happy, somewhat happy family. 
<laughs> like a lot of families, it's not always 100% happy. <laughs> Um, so a lot of that, a lot of that information was um, was updated um, as required by state law. We did have a public hearing. Um, we, as I said, we have multiple meetings. Our meetings are run very, very informally, and if people show up and they have something to say, they get an opportunity to say um, what it is that they want to. And so, you know, we had lots of input on that score. So that said. I'm going to let Steve earn his pay and, and uh, give you some more of the detailed information about what's in the draft. Thank Great. You, thank, thanks, Ken. So um, just like to explain a little bit more about the process and uh, delve a little bit deeper into the uh, issue of forest fragmentation and also energy planning to explain that and then uh, give you and um, anyone else an opportunity to, um, to ask questions at this point. Uh, I, I also passed out a timeline, and um, the uh, goal of this presentation, if you will, would be for you to set a date for your public hearing. Uh, that has to be at least 30 days from uh, the transmission of the plan, which we'll call tonight, and uh, no more than 120 days. So we can talk a little bit more uh, about the timeline um, after we've gone through the, the plan. So as, um, as you know, we work closely with the Central Mont Regional Planning Commission around many aspects of planning. They're our support, uh, and we've had a lot of consultation with them. Ken, uh, Ken mentioned people in the community like Alyssa, who helped us with the local uh, the local economy chapter, uh, Bill, of course, who helped us with local government chapter. Uh, the, the Central Mont Regional Planning Commission provided us with planning support for both the issue of forest fragmentation and uh, energy planning. Um, Ken alluded to the energy planning being optional for municipalities. It's required for regions. Uh, the State Act 174, which was enacted in, in 2016, required regional planning commissions to come up with a regional energy plan to meet the standards. And uh, you may have heard about um, a goal of 90% uh, renewable energy usage by the year 2050, and then interim goals uh, years 2025 and 2030. So uh, the regional plan addresses that. That plan has been approved. I serve as our commissioner to the regional uh, planning commission. So we've approved the, uh, the regional energy plan. So the local plan is optional, but it does give us a benefit in proceedings. Ken mentioned with the, uh, what's now called the Public Utility Commission, it used to be the Public uh, Service Board. And um, a good example of the role of the municipal plan in their proceedings is the uh, Verizon Northfield uh, cell tower, where our municipal plan certainly um, had a standing in that uh, procedure. So um, the energy plan is really intended to be proactive. It's intended to say, uh, this is the way we want to see renewable energy develop in the future in our municipality. Um, and so let's start with that. Um, it's, um, it's included in this uh, beefy package of paper and uh, is, is the draft energy plan. It's Appendix B. So um, let's just start there, and then I'll come back and say a few words about the forest fragmentation issue and then uh, open it up for questions. So the um, energy plan follows a set format, and if you go to the introduction, um, it, it talks about the plan, a little bit of the background that Ken and I have, have offered to you. And it has uh, basically three sections. It has uh, analysis and targets. Um, it looks at an analysis of current energy usage. This is, um, it's about two thirds of the way through, um, and it's just before the packet of uh, maps that, um, that are the uh, municipal plan maps. So um, section one is analysis and targets. And uh, it sets up a baseline of information about energy usage in uh, Waterbury. These are largely estimates. They come from sources such as Efficiency Vermont, uh, 
Green Mountain Power, um, some of our own data such as uh, municipal energy use, which is a very important component, and um, so on. And talks about uh, renewable energy uh, generation, um, the uh, hydro facility at Waterbury Dam. We mentioned the new hydro mini hydro generator that's in our water main on Guptill Road. Uh, and it talks about uh, all the arrays, uh, solar arrays, including the um, well field on Sweet Road. Ben and Jerry's has a large uh, solar array, a half a megawatt solar array. So it, it um, inventories uh, that energy generation and then talks about energy usage, including transportation, because that's a huge energy usage, as, as we all know. So, um, so it sets up some parameters and uh, did, does some analysis of that data. And then um, it talks about, in Section 2, pathways and implementation actions. And this is basically laying out um, a game plan, if you will. Um, like any good plan, whether it's sports or planning, you've got to have a game plan, and, and this is the game plan. And um, it uh, addresses conservation and energy efficiency, which is a huge uh, aspect of uh, moving forward in our, our energy future, if you will. And then it talks about reducing uh, transportation demand. This is on the uh, third page of the introduction. And, um, and then it talks about uh, land use, and this is an, another important aspect of energy use. Uh, the more we can concentrate, higher um, density, uh, the villages tend to be very efficient. Uh, ironically, cities are one of the most efficiently efficient forms of energy use because they are so dense if you look at it from a per capita basis. And villages have that same benefit. So land use is a very important aspect of conserving energy. And then the siting of renewable energy generation, which is um, you know, where we would like to see energy and where we want to discourage it. And then the, the third section is uh, mapping. And uh, there are a set of maps in here. They're 8 and a half by 11, because I didn't want to generate even more paper. Uh, they are in color. And uh, they're at the end of this section. And it starts with looking at uh, two aspects of natural resources. One is uh, what are termed known constraints. Um, and then uh, another one is possible constraints. Known constraints are the areas where we really don't want to see a solar array, array or a wind turbine uh, class two wetlands, um, the uh, rare endangered species sites, uh, the uh, floodplain, river corridor areas, uh, floodway, so on. So, so this is really the kind of the red flag areas for where we want to see facilities sited. And then the next page is the po possible constraints map. You can see it's filled with color. And this is basically the yellow flag where uh, there may be issues, steep slopes, uh, deer habitat, uh, bear habitat, uh, prime ag soils. It doesn't mean that these aren't good sites for renewable energy facilities. It's just the yellow flag that there needs to be further uh, site investigation in order to develop a site like that. So, uh, so that's the purpose of that um, map. And then it goes into a series of maps. Uh, for the public hearing, we'll have uh, we'll probably project them for the public hearing, so we can really uh, delve a little bit more into detail. But it talks about solar res resources, uh, south-facing slopes, uh, open fields, things of that nature. Solar resource map, wind resources, which tends to be, of course, the higher elevation areas. And uh, that includes uh, primary wind sites where we have a relatively uh, few because we're pulling out the um, uh, constraints uh, with, with uh, prime wind. And then secondary wind, where there may be some possible constraints. And again, it's primarily the ridge lines, uh, as we know, from uh, larger scale wind. But smaller scale wind is becoming much more popular. It's much more flexible. The technology is really evolving. And I, I think we're going to see a lot more smaller scale wind. The regional energy plan really encourages uh, towers of 120 feet or less, um, tub height of 120 feet or less. So what you might see on a farm or a school or even in somebody's backyard. So that's the, the energy plan in a nutshell. 
Um, I'll say just a few words about the forest fragmentation issue. Uh, Ken mentioned state statute. Uh, there's an Act 171, which was enacted just uh, last year in 2017, that uh, requires municipal plans to address forest fragmentation. Um, I think the law understands that uh, some fragmentation of forest area is inevitable, but um, asks us to look at these issues and try to minimize impacts of fragmentation due to development, uh, other, other activities. So, um, so we've looked at this with the Conservation Commission and um, also looked at it in terms of wildlife habitat because the, I think the law, my understanding of the law is it's really intended to protect uh, animal species, birds and mammals and so on that are dependent on interior forest areas. So, uh, so there's a map um, that I'll draw your attention to that's a new map that uh, was developed. Uh, it's 2.5, it's right in the middle of your 11 by 17 map packet. And um, it's titled Forest Resources and Connectivity Map. So this is based on state data. There's a state uh, mapping system called BioFinder and um, it's a publicly available um, mapping system. It's statewide. And this picks up a number of uh, layers from that uh, statewide mapping system. This map was uh, prepared by the Regional Planning Commission. The, plan uh, the Planning Commission reviewed it, made comments, and this is the draft map at this point. So it looks at these areas of inter interior forest and um, of, of different priority, mostly highest priority, and then uh, looks at, uh, at connectivity blocks, which is relating to wildlife. And uh, Schutzville Hill area is the one that you hear a lot about these days. The Conservation Commission has is, uh, is done a lot of work with the landowners in that area, uh, trying to highlight the importance. So, um, so this has an area um, around Schutzville Hill that's uh, purple on this map. And then it looks like, it looks at uh, road crossings where you uh, would tend to see more wildlife crossing and um, where you, we might want to address that through signage or some other means to try to minimize um, the uh, blood hitting, the bloodshed, <laughs> right, um, exactly. And the, the safety issue, to be honest, I mean, it could be deadly, obviously, hitting, hitting a large mammal. So, um, so this is, uh, there's some language in both the, uh, especially the natural resources section uh, that talks about, um, about how development should be handled. It's, the language is just cautionary. Uh, I think when the Planning Commission uh, gets back to the zoning rewrite, we'll look at that, especially in terms of the higher elevation areas and how some of these considerations may be built in to the uh, Ridgeline Hillside Steep Slope regulation. So um, it's meant to be informative. It's meant to meet statutory requirements. Uh, I mentioned the Regional Planning Commission. Uh, many of you probably remember Claire Rock, who is our zoning administrator. She's now a senior planner with the Regional Planning Commission. Uh, Claire has been working closely with us on the forest fragmentation issue. Uh, another one of their staff, who's now the uh, planning director for the city of Winooski, Eric Warwald, uh, drafted the energy plan for us. Uh, Water Relief, by the way, was very involved with that. Uh, we've had them come to a number of meetings and review the plan, provide comments, and um, so we've, we've had some good partnerships so far and intend to uh, continue that through this public hearing process. Hey, Mark. Very good, yeah. Steve. Um, jump back to the uh, energy portion of it. Um, how does the, how does the municipal plan uh, and the regional plan coincide as far as does the regional plan designate like a piece of pie from a percentage perspective of how much energy efficient uh, solar arrays and whatnot? or how many megawatts we have to provide as part of this 2050 uh, goal. Uh, do each, does each town get designated 
like a mile marker that they got to try to reach by certain dates to in the year 2050 uh, that that goal may be met of 90 uh, percent so. renewal in other words every every town based on their energy use should have to come up with X amount of a percentage of the overall usage um, you understand what I'm getting at here? So there's, yeah. a, there's an analysis of energy usage at the regional level, and there's also an analysis of energy usage at the local level. And a big part of what you have to do in the energy plan, both at the regional and the local level, and, and the local plan has to be consistent with the regional plan. So the regional plan has already, already been approved by the board, right? Right, by the board. So there's a regional plan. When our town plan comes from this process, one of the things they have to make a determination is that our local plan is consistent with the regional plan. So it's, you know, they, they can't be going one way and, and we're going another direction. But a lot of it has to do with um, being able to demonstrate that we have a sufficient amount of land area to meet the renewable energy goals that have been established by the state. So, if we have to meet so many megawatts of solar or wind, we have to be able to demonstrate that there's enough land area. We can't say everything's constrained. You can't put anything anywhere. So you have to be able to show that there's a sufficient land area. It doesn't necessarily mean that we're, we, the town, the town government's actually going to have to be the one that provides it. But we have to be able to show that there are sufficient, there's a sufficient amount of land area opportunities for people to be able to site those facilities. Yeah, I think specifically the, the regional plan is more generalized and you know it does do an inventory region wide in terms of energy use and the sources of that energy, you know, whether it's uh, you know oil, gas, um, you know, whatever the wood, whatever the source is, and looks at what's currently provided by by renewable sources and then um, I think the answer to your question is that um, it takes that um, that pie of, of what percent is renewable, what percent is non-renewable, and then it sets out a pathway to try to reduce that non-renewable source and, and expand. So a goal may be to try to encourage the use of electric vehicles, electric charging stations, and so on. So that's a way to try to steer, uh, no pun intended, the transportation towards um, electricity that can be generated in a, in a renewable fashion. So, so the, the, uh, the benefit of having a local plan is that we, we can look more specifically at what our um, demands are and what our usage and, and have strategies which make sense for Waterbury rather than having it just dictated by the by the region, so the region has some has mapping which is region wide that is you know includes Waterbury obviously, but um, but this goes into a lot more detail as far as what our what our current use is and what uh, what a pathway moving forward look would look like for Waterbury. So this 2050 thing is is it just a suggested goal or is it a mandate to be 90 percent renewable by 2050? It's a target. It's like any any so, of the like climate change targets or so we'll look at energy targets. It's a it, from, it's a goal that from, we're going to try to achieve. Yeah, each yeah. town will look at its better strengths as far as you know. Do they have access ability to or availability for more solar uh, arrays versus wind or um, you know different types of abilities to get to that milestone uh, it may not be a little bit of everything it may be one stronger like several wind towers as opposed to Waterbury maybe having one or two or none at all um, so I guess it does the plan point out um, through its process there are specific avenues that are better suited for uh, different types of like the solar or um. <clears throat> yeah, I think it tries so, to so show so part of the mapping that was done at the regional level already 
identifies areas that are best favorable for for those types of things. So, mm -hmm. so they're able to do some analysis. For example, they can map out places where there's steep slopes and where you would have, say, southern exposure, um, those sorts of things. And some of the things that have been identified as known constraints have already been identified at the at the state and or the regional level. So. So as Steve is suggesting, this is ours kind of fine tunes it a little bit. But they already did a lot of the heavy lifting in terms of, of, of identifying, just in terms of an energy production basis, where, where the, the low-hanging fruit is likely to be. But Chris, I, I think the important thing to remember is what uh, Ken talked about, is that there's no mandate that municipalities generate any electricity at all. It's simply that you can't use your town plan or your zoning bylaws to prohibit any of these things from being built in your town. You've got to have sufficient areas where these types of facilities can be sited. And then at this point, we're leaving it to the market to decide whether a, a solar array is going to be built somewhere or a wind tower is going to be built somewhere. There's nothing in state law now, anyway, that says each municipality has to go out and generate X amount of you know, megawatts or anything like that. It's simply that, that you can't exclude the renewable uh, energy resources from being developed in your community. And, and the plan, as they just said, tries to identify areas where it's best suited to do it. And I guess, from what you're talking about, these known constraints, it's identifying areas where if somebody came in and said, we want to put something here, you could say no, because it's a wetland or it's a, uh, you know, it's in the floodplain or what have you. Right, the, the red flags always go off with industrial scale projects. And those are the ones where they clearly they need to be cited with the greatest care, um, whether they're they're um, potentially going to be cited where there's a very real bona fide uh, sensitive area, or you know part of it may also be you know aesthetics, um, you know large scale energy production facilities, regardless of how the energy is being produced. Um, generally, it's not. Um, viewed as being attractive. Um, it's one thing to put a bunch of solar panels on your roof like I have and my neighbors don't even notice it. Um, right. You know, you fill the entire field um, with solar panels, so it's a very different thing. And so, you know, we, we talked a little bit about, you know, the Chutesville Hill area, for example, and both whether it's in terms of forest fragmentation or any other kind of resource protection, you know, it's a very sensitive area. And we've had multiple conversations with the Conservation Commission, not just as part of this update, but in other things, where um, that area um, really needs to be handled with, with kit gloves. And, you know, so having some language in our town plan is going to give us some additional leverage when somebody other than the town is making a decision. We want to be able to have our best foot forward to be able to articulate what's important to Waterbury to this other board that's going to make a decision that we don't get a chance to override. And that's, that's what I think is, is really important. Now, the other thing that in terms of, of things that the town might be able to do at the local level um, is to encourage and or facilitate things, for example, like um, electric vehicle charging stations. Um, you know, Steve mentioned, you know, transportation is a component to it. You know, well, having electric vehicles, having them be able to recharge, um, having them be able to recharge with renewable resources, that can be an important component of helping us to meet those state, those state goals for, you know, switching from um, fossil fuel-based energy sources to something that's more renewable source. I have a question. Um, I may just, not be on. Okay. Um, I don't see anything in here in headings that relate at all to you know character or aesthetics. And Route 100, uh, the corridor is a. Are you hearing me? Okay. Yeah. The um, 
the corridor is a, is a byway, a scenic or a uh, byway, the Green Mountain Byway, um, a designated sign byway, and it doesn't just pertain to what you can see from Route 100, because I was part of that whole process when I was on the Conservation Commission, but it's kind of extends away from the, the road, too. So how does that mesh with what you just said, Ken, about um, industrial scale developments, which, um, so it isn't just Shootsville Hill, which you can clearly see because of the forest, um, the uh, wildlife connectivity has got its own, some sort of protection or something by recognizing it, but uh, is there a way to extend that to um, other parts of Route 100? Want to do the speech yeah. um, So we had some conversation with uh, members of the uh, Conservation Commission about this issue uh, in terms of scenic quality. And um, there was a lot of discussion about uh, trying to do some sort of um, scenic quality mapping. So what we did is put uh, an action item, and I was, um, I was going to try to find it here. I think it's in the natural resources chapter in the actions um, under, under um, scenic resources. But um, the idea is to, to try to do some sort of, um, of inventory. And there, there is a kind of a scientific uh, approach to this, if you will, uh, as you know, being a landscape architect, to um, analyzing uh, scenic views and, and so on. We address it in our um, Ridgeline Hillside Steep Slope regs kind of in reverse in terms of uh, trying to have development be what we call minimally visible up on the higher uh, mm -hmm. hillsides. But um, so this is a project that we've now identified. It's, it's a new action item in the plan uh, that we've identified to uh, look at creating a scenic resources map. Other, some other communities have, have done this. Didn't you mention uh, that Williston did a scenic resource map as uh, part of your work there? Right. So, so the short answer is we, we discussed it. We don't really have the things in place now to really do it effectively. Mm -hmm. And so we've instead what we've done is identified that we put this on the to-do list going okay. forward is something that we, we should do to help us to, to, to get to that issue. Because um, to really do it effectively, it ha would have to be based on some kind of a study, and we just don't have that in place okay. today. I, thank you. I, I mean, I have some knowledge of Act 250 and <clears throat> Criterion 8 and the whole issue of context, and I guess all of that would go into your study as well, identifying what the different con contexts are. And, Go from there. Thank you. Yeah, I think we have to hire a consultant that uh, really has some expertise, and you know, it would need to be a project that um, you, as a select board, would be interested in, in right. moving forward with as well. Yeah, the two mapping projects that uh, were added into the plan was one uh, to do some uh, additional mapping for wildlife corridors, especially in the Shootsville Hill area, and then the other one is to do a, a scenic resource mapping project. I had a question, thank you. I had a question about the map that you were just pointing to. Oh, the forest resources. <laughs> so the, and yeah, the and on the, on the uh, east side of Route 100 in Shootsville Hill area, it's shaded purple. Uh, it's the highest priority connectivity block. There are a number of like white areas that are cut out of it. Are those um, why does it have sort of uh, pock marks in that? Yeah, those are typically fields. Okay. So, so this map was generated using uh, aerial photogrammetry. Um, so they're not forested. So they're, they're open. Non-forested areas. Okay. Correct. Yeah. And then I was curious why, on the west side of Route 100, where my understanding is that large mammals are crossing Route 100 at Shootsville Hill. So they're coming from the state forest. None of that is shaded as a highest priority connectivity block. It's just a prior priority connectivity block. It's yellow. Any reason why that would be? Or that's just the way it 
turned up. Yeah, I don't. Um, I'm that not surprised one me. who's highly knowledgeable at, at, about this map, but it, it really has to do with how uh, forest blocks function as a large block. And I think that the determination with Mount Mansfield State Forest, especially, is that functions as a block, Shootsville Hill functions as a block, and then I think the state did some analysis of each of those blocks to say, well, what, what what's the value of that area? And Shootsville Hill, knowing that wildlife is the highest value, I think that was termed uh, a connectivity block. Uh, Mount Mansfield Forest, even though obviously there's there are um, important um, Wildlife corridors overall, the forest block is what's is what's most significant. Okay. Did the Central Vermont Regional Planning Commission work with a, a Agency of Natural Resources who had done mapping two years ago, and that was part of what was the used as exhibits at the um, North Hill Verizon Tower um, hearings? Well, oh, you don't really know. The, well, yeah, the Conservation Commission brought a, a map. This is purely data right out of BioFinder. Okay. So this is data that's publicly available already. Uh, we haven't done any modification to the state data. Uh, the Conservation, came, a Conservation Commission came with a map that they had developed in concert with uh, the Agency of Natural Resources and okay. uh, some other partners. and the. The Planning Commission felt that it was really premature to put a map in that hadn't gone through a really thorough public process. Mm -hmm. So that's why uh, the Planning Commission worked with the Conservation Commission to come up with an action item to do that mapping. And in that case, we would involve uh, agency of natural resources, people like Jens Helke. We'd look at some of the, these specific areas and really look at them in more detail. It Thanks. looks as though on page 133, with reference to that, it, it looks as though you're considering it uh, more of a future action item anyway. Uh, it looks like in, in prior language, uh, in previous pages, it, it discussed um, what the current uh, zoning is there and uh, the fact that it's it's created some unintended consequences, and the follow-up here is that you have the intent to continue to work on that to uh, delineate these particular areas and, and address it uh, with more, uh, more instructive language in the future. Is that a fair assessment? Yes. Yeah. Because it obviously involves a lot of private property. Mm -hmm. So uh, you know, we want to be very careful as a municipality when we're um, looking at um, how the plan and uh, zoning regulations in particular impact private property and make sure that it's, we have a good public process that we involve as private property owners and uh, come to some consensus on how we want to do and, and, and it's also always important to remember that the town plan is not zoned. And so the, the zoning, which is our regulations, should be based and help to implement what's in the town plan. But when you move from the town plan to zoning, you're moving from the more general to the more specific. And mm -hmm. as Steve mentioned, there is some mapping, some work that's already been done by the Conservation Commission. We really feel it needs to be taken just one step further, that that would help to inform us on potential um, zoning changes. Mm -hmm. Is there any specific pressures based on the state's guidelines about forest fragmentation that that uh, have, in other words, put pressure on you guys to to draft certain things in, in the municipal plan, ad addressing specifics about forest fragmentation, or what's the overall goal, just to try to make people aware of the, the issues pertaining to forest fragmentation and, and what to you know, to do to help prevent it, or is there specific guidelines by the state's rules that you're trying to meet with this? It's, uh, as, as I understand it, Chris, it's not that specific. Okay. Um, you know, ultimately the plan has to be approved by the Regional Planning Commission. So, um, you know, for lack of a better word, you know, we gotta be able to show that we did some sort of an analysis that makes sense 
um, and that we have some ideas and some strategies that are going to help to preserve forest blocks where they occur um, for all of the reasons that we might think about why it's important to do that from um, whether it has to do with water resources or wildlife resources or any of those things. And um, you know, ultimately, the Regional Planning Commission will have to look at it and say, yeah, that, you know, that makes sense. And no doubt there'll be a number of questions like, well, did you look at this? Did you look at that? As people start to drill down into that map. I think in terms of Waterbury, one of the, I think, both an advantage and a challenge for us at the same time is that we're a community. We have lots of forested areas, lots of big forested areas that are protected because they're controlled by the state. Um, and uh, so, so without doing anything, we're already going to do a lot. Okay. At the same time, because we've got those big areas, um, it's also important to make sure that they're still connected in some way. Because as we all know, Route 100 goes right down the middle, splits the town east and west. And you have these big, giant forested blocks on either side. Um, you, you wouldn't you wouldn't want to not consider how those things are going to be connected in some way. So I think that's the, that's the challenge for us. Unfortunately, one, one of the big, biggest contributing factors to uh, you know, participating in for, forest fragmentation is uh, financial pressures. People having to be forced to sell large tracts of land or choosing to sell large tracts of land that go into hands like people like me who, you know, turn around and develop it, and hence your forest fragmentation problem. You know, uh, I had a little discussion with Mr. Shumlin back when he was in office, the earlier attempt to implement uh, forest fragmentation rules at the state level uh, stirred up quite a hornet's nest with a lot of a lot of people. Uh, so I was just wondering how that had kind of backed down a little bit uh, from from that first attempt, but uh, sounds like it has to some degree. So, yeah, I don't think the goal of state law or what we're being asked to do is to prevent development. I think the whole idea is to try to uh, you know channel development where where it is appropriate and has the least impact, and try to keep really critical areas intact. So. So that's the benefit of a plan, is it gives us an opportunity to try to uh, make, do something that makes sense for Waterbury. There are many parts of the state that don't have town planning efforts as sophisticated as Waterbury's. They may not have zoning regulations. They may not have subdivision regulations. And the challenges for them are, would be far greater than for us, because we do have some of those processes and those tools that we're already utilizing. and that. You know, gives us a chance. It's Very also good. really important to understand what the resources are so that you can plan accordingly and be responsible. And I think once landowners understand what the resources are, that's helpful too. Yeah, that's one big benefit of the plan is it identifies <clears throat> to identify the resources. Um, what do we have to do with respect to this timetable? Is that something that needs to be adopted by by the board? Right, so the next step, uh, I put this in my introduction and I mentioned it to Bill earlier, is that um, we're, uh, we're on a bit of a crunch to get the municipal plan reapproved by December 9th because that's when our current plan uh, expires. Expired. So this timeline is designed to get us to that goal. And uh, so what we're requesting is that um, you would warn a public hearing or authorize us to um, warn a public hearing for your meeting on October uh, 15th, your second meeting in October, uh, and you could pick a time. I'm assuming you'd be willing to do this at a regular meeting. Uh, I think it's a good opportunity to, to make sure that we get full participation. So. Um, to the extent possible. To the extent possible, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and we do try to publicize these things uh, far and wide. What are your thoughts, Bill? Well, yeah, that's fine. Um, I just had a concern about the timeline. Um, the October 15th public hearing, they can warn that and meet the 30-day deadline. Right. 
I'm concerned about the November 5th select board makes changes. Oh, the, the next one is only a 15 day? Notice. Right, right. So the way it works is the first one has to be between 30 and 120 days. Okay. And then the next one's a 15 day warning. So the idea is after your first public hearing, you, the select board, can make any substantive changes to the plan. You can make any revisions, things that you might like to have changed. Uh, I would anticipate you might engage the Planning Commission. They're willing to help out if you need suggestions for language or have a concern that they might address. And then uh, on November 5th, that would be an opportunity to um, incorporate the comments and um, have, a new, have another draft to warn for uh, <coughs> December 3rd. So that's the so goal. It's only a 15 day Only 15 day warning for the second one. Correct. No, both of them are actually 15 day warnings, but we just have this time frame. Okay. So the language that's in here now is pretty much final draft form from your perspective, the work that you've done. And then it's just a matter of the select board having the opportunity for more public input and any finalized changes Further before? Revisions, right? Okay. Um, I mean, the planning commission did adopt this on the 27th, right? Yes. Yeah. So okay. yeah, it's all set. Right. Uh, well, the the question I had was just about the language uh, relative to the uh, substation here on Winooski Street, and um, there's there are power lines terminating there at the uh, substation on. Winooski Street, and I, it had me scratching my head a bit. I thought, oh, the plan needs to be revised. Yes. Right. OK, well, these are the types of things why we need more eyes on it, because any comments like that, email me, because obviously it's been moved. We missed that so far. There's going to be plenty I, of I think it's on yet. one of the maps that the uh, uh, okay. planning commission provided you as well. So right. they're probably they dealing with dated that. material. Outdated right. mapping yeah. data. Yep, good catch. OK, I'll make a note of that. And uh, But yeah, those are the types of things that we want to change Tweak in the next draft. Yep. But it, those things don't have to be done by the planning commission. Right. They've adopted the plan. So I think what you should do now is entertain a motion to one hearing for October 15th, the public hearing right. to receive public comments on the plan. And then those types of things, Mark, will come up at that hearing. In the and we can tweak them in final form. Change those, and that's not really a substantive thing. Well, you, the board can make substantive changes after their first hearing, but when after the second hearing, then any substantive changes after that hearing would require a third hearing. So we want to catch as many of these things right. as we can. Yeah. Yep. Is it, is it more appropriate to discuss changes or to talk things out more at a select board meeting? I just feel if I just show up to a meeting, I'm like, oh, I want this change, this change, this change. Is that appropriate or is it better to just bring up something that we want to discuss at a select board meeting verse? Well, it'll be your regular meeting. I think what I would suggest is you warn the hearing for that uh, night on this draft uh, and then allow some time for discussion mm -hmm. among yourselves so that um, you have an opportunity to talk about the plan uh, further. And, and this, as it is, is uh, available on the town website for... for it's already on the town yeah. website, correct. So this would be the draft that you would, you would warn this draft to. And the other thing that I would add is that, that, as I'm sure you all know, is when you have a public hearing, you never really know what is going to come forth at the public hearing. So taking that first step and just seeing and hearing what it is that, that folks come up with, because no doubt there will be some other uh, either errors of omission or commission or uh, some things that perhaps people might like to see added or changed in some fashion that I think would help to inform you as to what changes might go into the plan. This, this format was very useful with respect to highlighting where the substantive changes were mm -hmm. and everything, so it makes it much easier to review. Okay. Um, I will make the motion that we uh, warn a public hearing on the plan for our October 15th select board meeting. The first public meeting. Yes. Okay. So you, you actually have to warn a public hearing for the plan 
it, it can be the same date as mm -hmm. your select board meeting, but it's not a separate a select board meeting. Okay. So I would, include in your motion to warn the public hearing at 7 o'clock or whatever time that's 7 10 or whatever you want. And then, you know, the select board typically would, you don't need a quorum of the select board to conduct a public hearing. It sounds kind of odd, but you really don't. Mm. Um, and then the select board would just go into its meeting after the public right. hearing. So public meeting is just going to happen to coincide the same date as our select board meeting. Is there a timeline suggested here too as well at seven? Well, I think seven o'clock is kind of a normal time. Uh, I think we're yes. talking about half an hour. Uh, yeah, I'd give it at least 45 minutes, something like that. Uh, yeah, I think did you should give it at least 45, 45 minutes. Did you say you were thinking about doing a presentation also? Uh, if you'd like, we could. For we could have public. maps available. Um, I think it would be brief because I think we want yeah. as much time as possible for comment. Yeah. So I think it'd be quite brief. Okay. Consider the motion made. Is there a second? I'll second. Any further comments or questions? Do you think it would make any sense to start earlier? Well, you could do it at 6.30, but it, it's up to the board if you... That's why I asked about timeline. Yeah. I don't know what, if there's any uh, insight as to what might be on the agenda by October 15th. No, no, no clue. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Well, then we'll just uh, leave it at 7. Okay. Motion been made and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Great. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Well done. You're welcome to keep your home for uh, yeah, thank you for baseball playoff. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Congratulations on your retirement. Yes, thank you. <laughs> You're a luminary. Try not to take advantage of it. <laughs> okay. Skip and lefty. You're, um, you're swing at the bat here. People, that I won't have to use Ann's microphone. I'm going to give him a cup of water here. Some bugs right up on the shelf to the left. And do they need another microphone? Pardon me? Do they need another microphone? Because it wouldn't hurt. <laughs> um, this is a warrant meeting for the Edward Ferrar Utility District in case we have three commissioners come as we do tonight. So and we're legal um it's not a joint meeting we wanted to be on your uh, agenda here to talk about 51 south main street and uh, i would say selling property public property is the toughest thing the trustees have had to do in terms of deciding what to do and things so um do you have those yeah. Bill's got some information he's going to hand out to you. And I think at our last commissioner's meeting, um, we talked about subdividing the property, keeping park for parking, and then selling the building um, and a smaller part of the parcel. Um, we had one unsolicited proposal for the building. Um, I don't think they secured financing and things. So uh, we wanted to share this with you, knowing the motion um, that was passed at town meeting and things, and uh, whether, you know, in the future, um, and Steve worked on this for us. This is the map of the lot. 
what we were considering and we'll probably talk about at our meeting next week is going out with a new RFP, um, you know, subdividing it, selling the building um, with 0.496 acres and the municipality of the district, utility district, keeping this three tenths of an acre um, at the back. So it's just, just to, your map has two sides to it. Um, this is a subdivision oh. that the, the former village trustees asked staff to, to look into whether or not the property could be subdivided. So I asked Steve to look into it from a planning perspective and then also come up with a couple of scenarios. So uh, the map is the same overlay basically and on one side you see the back parcel is three tenths of an acre and as Skip just said the, the parcel that the building is left on is 0.496 uh, acres. The other side uh, the subdivision was a little smaller. It was 0.22 acres, and uh, the uh, bigger parcel was, you can't read it, but it's 0.576, I think. Mm -hmm. And um, the only difference is that, of course, in the bigger parcel, you can get a few more parking spaces. Uh, so that's what the map shows. And then the 8.5 by 11 paper that I sent around, the trustees also asked if I could work with Dan Sweet to try to put some uh, values on these parcels. So the scenario one, which is the 0.22 acre uh, subdivision in the back, that parcel, uh, Dan put a value of 129,600 on, and the uh, 0.576 to the edge of the right of way uh, where the, the parcel the building is on is 135,000. And then scenario two, which is the three tenths of an acre, uh, he's got 131,400 for that parcel. And then uh, 133,200 uh, for the, for the 0.496 acre parcel. Um, the value does not include the building at all. The building, in fact, may be a liability, mm -hmm. but if the building wasn't there, is what Dan really looked at. Um, the building is really the issue for the uh, utility district right now, but that's what these two documents are, and then uh, we can talk about the rest of the ideas that we would I have a question. What's the private parcel to CL? What was the CL? Center line. Center line. Yeah, the, the, uh, for some reason, uh, Dan, um, he, he showed what the, the value of the parcel would be to the edge of the right of way. So that would be the 496 acres on the 0.3 acre parcel. The CL is the center line of the road. Um, and, um, you know, he said if, if you valued it to the center line of the road, it would be potentially a little bit higher. That was on the, on the other one. I wouldn't worry about that okay. middle number at all, Jane, because okay. the center line of the road is in the road. And it's of no use to anyone who wants to What was the value of the 0.496? 133,200. Right. 133,200. It's right on that eight and a half by eleven graphic sheet that I gave you. Okay. And uh, Steve, I think you estimated the point three acre parcel the municipal was going to keep at this time could handle thirty. Uh, thirty. Thirty. Uh, parking spaces. Correct. Yeah, I did some site line analysis uh, at Bill's request, and um, the uh, 0.3 was about 30, the 0.22 was about 20 spaces. That would be the just the municipal part of the lot. And then there was some other analysis with what the building might involve. Well. Did you take into consideration uh, handicapped spaces at all, which are bigger than regular spaces. I, I didn't, but... The only reason I ask is yeah. because Skip had asked a question about the Elm Street lot, and, you know, there's... 
in one sense of the word, you can say, you know, we lost a couple spaces because those handicapped spaces seldom get parked in, but you have to have them. But it's, right, it's a right. minor so detail. So it might be a little bit of a space less, or there's some green that's built in for screening, and maybe the handicapped spot could use part of that area. And if we were to, you know, sell the pri labeled private parcel here, we would have to negotiate rights away and things uh, into the back part of the municipal lot there. So um, I think this is the thinking of the commissioners to go out with an RFP um, proposing this. Uh, you know, we wanted to let the select board know, I think in the future, you know, the need for parking and whether the town is interested. I know what the town meeting they approved 37.5, but had conditions on this, the spaces and things. I've also asked Bill to uh, get the information for what the trustees did for the Elm Street lot, um, which we did in 99 and 2000. Yeah. Um, so this information is coming out that you can kind of compare what you might uh, get involved with here. Is the, uh, my, this mic is acting up, but um, is the plan then for the RFP to go out? This mic is working. It was working. Yeah, yeah, it kicks off. Off you get. Is the plan to go out with an RFP with the building still in its current state? Or yes. is the plan so that yes. you are no longer planning on knocking the building down? We were. Yourself? No. Okay. We were going to get an RFP to see what the cost was. We had a uh, unsolicited um, proposal to use the building. Um, we weren't really intending to tear it down. We were just looking to get the cost, so we didn't feel it was worthwhile to go out for an RFP and have professionals prepare one when we really had no intention of doing it. I think we. Uh, Set aside fifty thousand. Yeah, for two, the town uh, village meeting of two thousand seventeen. You appropriated fifty thousand dollars. Conclusion decided to do it, but you decided not to do it. So. But yeah, I guess my my question is: is have you considered the idea of flipping what you would keep and what you would sell? So. I think we're going to propose the three tenths of an acre, keeping and selling the so-called private parcel. But the idea of keeping that back parcel is for parking? Future parking, yes, not that the district would develop it because we're not in the parking um, business anymore, but that it would be available for the town um, to decide to purchase now or in the future um, and things. I guess I don't quite understand why, you know, you would, I, I guess my, my question is, why wouldn't you um, have the public parking along the property line so that somebody developing this site doesn't have to give you an easement to get through to use a parking lot at the back <coughs> of the lot? I don't think the lot would be wide enough to have parking and then to get access to the back if they were going to keep the building. Okay, so you would entertain the, then having an easement of some sort to allow people to have access to the public right. parking lot at the back? Yes. Well, that was going to be one of my questions. Under that scenario, does that price tag reflect I guess the burden of the right of way um, across that property to gain access to the municipal park, what would be perhaps a municipal parking lot in the rear? Because um, usually something like that devalues. Get out past Dan Sweet. Yeah. Okay. Well, I didn't know if, if, well, yeah, the, if that had been talked the, about. The ultimate, okay. the ultimate decider of what the value of that 0.496 parcel is if if the I mean I presume skip that uh, if you decide to go forward the district would 
indeed go forward and subdivide the lot and then create a deed for the new lot, I mean, the, the lot to the front of the road. And whether Dan has a price on it of 135 or 285, um, when the trustees go to sell it, the highest bidder is going to determine what the price of it is. And he'll know that there's a right of way. He or she will know there's a right of way there. So. Um, Lefty or Cindy, have anything to add to that? Or? <coughs> no, it's quite something we dealt with a lot of ways. And we're going to look like from anybody developing it, like that we probably are going to look at splitting it somehow. Do you recall what the initial asking was originally for the first RFP? Do you recall what you were looking to get out of it then? Two, a minimum of 200000 So we weren't looking for any decision from the select board tonight. This is to kind of let you know where the we're utility the commissioners were headed. To let you know, I, I would recommend that um, you do kind of look into it, reserving it for future parking, if not immediate. Um, I would say, um, based on the Elm Street lot, um, the village spent, um, I had originally told Bill there were 18 spaces, but when I actually counted them, there were only 16. And handicap space takes up two because you have to have a space for the van to open up. So there's really only four, um, 14 and uh, 16 minus two. So 14 real spaces. And at those costs, it's about $14,000 a space that we spent to develop them. Yeah, 18 years ago. Right. Um, and if you factored in the CPI and things that today, that was in 2000, so right. it's now 18 years ago, that cost today would be $20,000 a lot. And the total cost would be $34,000. Um, Right, and I think it's a little bit apples and oranges because um, in order to get the spaces on Elm Street, the, the village had to buy the building that was there and then you had to take the building down. I mean, it was burned by the fire department and it didn't cost a lot to take it down, but there was, there was some cost uh, involved in the fact that it wasn't a undeveloped lot. This, three-tenths of an acre parcel, you know, if the town did decide to buy that three-tenths of an acre parcel, they wouldn't have to do anything with the building. You'd just buy the plant and then build the parking lot. Uh, you wouldn't have to worry about the building. But I was interested in your comment, Mark, about did you think about flipping it? Yeah, I mean, it comes down to visibility. I think some of the problems with, you know, we've done those parking studies in the town or in the village, and, you know, there are quite a, there are quite a few parking spaces are actually available to the public, but the understanding of which ones are public versus private and the question mark, I think, to your average consumer, even locals, don't necessarily know what what's public and what's private. And I think potentially say a building gets, say this building gets raised and another building goes up and there's gonna be a parking lot here to try to explain clearly that there's a parking lot behind whatever is now here, I think is a much harder scenario to quickly describe through signage versus the, if the municipal parking, if, if, the, if the idea is that we were as a town considered to do any kind of parking project here, I would think that the public parking lot would be up front and then there would be a right of way in the parking lot of a pass through in that parking lot to a develop, developed whatever, residential, first floor commercial, whatever they want to do, to me makes more sense from a parking perspective. As a business owner, it is, as a you know developer, that's, you're right, uh, to have parking out in the front and have the building in the back rather than having constant traffic 
through your yeah. yard to get to that back building would certainly be a preference. Well, because uh, not only they're going to park back there, but then now they're walking back to get to Main Street. Depending on what the building is, I could see that as potentially devaluing the options because if it's residential that gets built there, if we're trying to say there's a public parking space back here and people are going to their cars late, I don't know, it's just a scenario that I think creates a little bit more of a, of a question flow. mark for me. I feel like the flip of the, like again, if you go the other way, then and we consider this as a town to purchase, we would be responsible for raising the building, hence why I asked that question. Right. Well, right, <clears throat> right now, what you're talking about, Mark, is quite visible. If you look at that parking lot, most any day now, there's very few cars parked out there in back of it, whether it's because people don't realize they can get out there or what, I don't know. But it's very few times that there's anybody in that parking lot this last month or so. Yeah. There's a big sign there that's uh, yeah. The <laughs> signs there. They, it's well, just not being used. I think right the now. fact that the building is not being used <clears throat> may contribute a little to that because people have kind of sort of dropped off the radar screen as a usable, functioning space. And I think if you had a, an active business in this building and, or a, you know some activity there, that <clears throat> that would potentially change that. Um, I, I guess I understand where you're coming from, Mark, and that I had the same question about getting just getting an easement to get to that public lot in the back <clears throat> would be something you have to deal with. But I, I would say, I, I think it's by putting a parking lot out by the street, you would be changing this one, you're eroding the character of Main Street by removing a, um, the, the potential for a Historic building. A historic building, a building that maybe we're going to take down a historic building, but something that would have that character. It would also has the uh, walk-in business that's very appealing for somebody to just, for pedestrian walk-in right from the street, for uh, anybody trying to rent out uh, space or restaurant or anything else. Like you're, you know, you have yep. an active, successful restaurant right on Main Street uh, versus putting it at the back of the lot. That's, that's kind of a disadvantage, too, I think, so. Good argument, Jane. I, I think that, um, I, I think that in a, I, I can understand where you're coming from, but by cutting up the lot, it, it would remove the, some of the creativity or flexibility for somebody um, to develop this, which we saw in the, the, the developer that you had come in here around December, January. Um, <clears throat> which had a very attractive, the person that you were, that you met with a few Parsons. times, I don't remember his name, no. Chris, um, what was his last name? Parsons. 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 I mean, he had a, to me, a very attractive development, which was using the building at the front and was willing, he was able to shoehorn, shoehorn in quite a bit of parking on the side and the back. Um, but I don't know whether, you know, somebody else, purchasing this and having less land would be constrained. I guess you, that time would tell. That's what you decide to do. Well, if they made us an offer that we couldn't refuse, they might have the whole thing, um, you know, but there was no guarantee you'd get any public parking out of it. That's, well, I understand the need for public the parking, and I think, um, you know, the parking study said we had a good balance as long as we continue to have some public parking because um, we have such successful businesses downtown and places that are the parking needs to be within a five minute walk or whatever our businesses you know is this that is the segue to the next item yeah. <laughs> steve by doing this split on this lot what's are there coverage rules in this zoning there's this is in the downtown commercial zoning district, and there's no minimum lot size. Uh, you can actually fill 100% of the lot with the building, because many buildings up, especially where your building is, cover an uh, entire parcel. The Simpson Graves building, WD. You can go lot line to lot line, basically. You can. <laughs> but, um, but I came up with this um, layout based on Chris Carson's uh, design for uh, reconstructing the existing building, but I think the 
RFP may want to provide a lot of flexibility. I would agree with Jane that as a developer, it's a lot more attractive to have curb appeal of a building, uh, especially if you're going to do any kind of um, you know more uh, commercial use of the of the building. But uh, Bill, and I can work with you folks if you want in terms of the RFP and come up with. I think when you approach. looked at these two options, you pretty much. Um, took Chris Parsons plan, we reduced, I think you took out some of the seats in a restaurant. Right, I removed the restaurant and that provided enough uh, space for municipal parking. So he could still do pretty much what he proposed and have the municipal parking in the back with some small reduction in um, you'd have office space instead of restaurant space. Yeah, office and uh, residential. Is uh, how does an easement by necessity work in terms of the, the, how it gets defined through the other lot? Well, the zoning um, requires a 50 foot easement, but the developer 50 foot wide, 50 feet wide but to access development. But um, the de the developer review board can approve a, a narrower easement. But the layout I did and. Um, you know, we are, we're really not talking about a specific site plan here tonight, but we'd use the aisle and the parking for the front building to access the rear. So uh, the easement would essentially be over that aisle through the through the parking to access the rear. And it's done very com very commonly in um, you know urban areas. You said that zoning was village commercial. No, uh, no, it's downtown commercial. Downtown. Yeah. Um, so anyway, we wanted to let you know where we were um, and that I wouldn't expect anything to happen. And if you decide to do something, maybe it comes up at the next town meeting. Um, I don't know that we would be, you know, anything would have happened before then anyway in, in terms of... Uh, you know, it's been a slow process here. I, I think we would ask Bill to have a draft of this two-part RIP for our meeting next week to kind of look at if that's possible. Um, two-part RIP? Did you say two-part RIP? No, two, two parcel, the okay. subdividing, you know, that's what uh, we talked about at the last, I think, going out and I think we're looking at the three tenths of an acre there, and uh, kind of decide, uh, you know, going out do it. We've had a number of people that have told Lefty they're interested in making an offer, but they have a hard time putting the words on paper to come up with something. So we haven't heard from anybody except the one unsolicited and Chris Parsons, uh, you know, since the other. So your RFP would be to, to what? To sell this lot with the building and have somebody else give, yes. you, give you a proposal for a development on it? Yeah. Do you need to approve that? What, whatever they're going to put? Or are you just going to sell it? I don't well, we would like to know what they plan to do. it. We're going to have to go to a public vote, and the public yeah. is going to want to know what are you proposing to put there um, and things. and. Uh, yeah, that, I mean that's the that's the big challenge when you sell municipal property is that you know the the public owns it, and it's not like you or I just deciding to put our parcel up for sale. The people are going to. I mean, it was very clear when Dan Johnson came in. You know, he made a good proposal. The trustees thought it was a good proposal. It was. Uh, Put in two proposals actually, but when it came to the public, they didn't like what he was proposing to do there, so they decided not to sell it. And that's the challenge: is you've got to get over the hump of, of getting the public to approve the, the sale. So now, when you, knowing what they're going to do with it is kind of part and parcel of it. When you say the public, in this case, you mean the the water and sewer, the utility district. Yeah. Okay. The, it's the same voters as used right. to be yeah. 
um, in the village that. that the district boundaries are the same and it's the same. We're a, a change in name only and got rid of all of our municipal obligations and so parking is now handed off to you folks and things, so. Um, and you decided not to tear the building down because? Well, we had a proposal where they wanted to reuse it, for oh, one. That's right, you said. Um, you know, and you're going to spend, we think it's worth just as much with the building there as it is without mm -hmm. the building, and the village would spend 50000 and we're probably not going to get it back. Right. So. Okay. So I suggest. Do you have anything to add to that? No, I guess that pretty little well clear on it. I so, haven't met Cindy before. I'll say, oh. I'll say one more thing on this, and I don't know how it'll fall, but I, I think was the, the challenge is exactly <laughs> what you're talking about. Uh, I think there's a lot of people that want this to potentially just be an open park, but I'm sure the town plan addresses it, which I haven't gotten into, but the, the idea of density growing out of the downtown and each one of these lots are very important when it comes to the future of this town. And I fear the development concerns that we saw with Dan Johnson's project is going to reemerge with anything that happens to this property just because it does touch a significant number of residential customers. And I don't know how to make sure that that is considered. I think this, the thing that I would hate to see is that we don't have an opportunity to, to address the demand concerns when it comes to housing and affordability. And I think a, a, a large format residential project is a potential use for this lot. And I, and I fear that that's not going to happen because there's a lot of people that will band together and fight that from whether it's air rights, sun, whatever. I think it's just a, I don't know how to word that going forward, but I do have concerns that we'll kick this can down the road for more years and we're not getting, you know, income from a tax perspective and there's people in this town looking for housing, yada, yada, yada. So I would hope that there is someone to make that fight during this whole scenario because I just think that you know we could potentially be in a scenario where we have more housing for people. Well, one one novel way to get at that, I understand exactly what you're saying, and the, the problem is is it's the utility district that owns it. Sure. And if the town. If the utility district and the town could work out a deal where the parcel is owned by the town and whether it's buy it outright for $264,000 or come up with some kind of agreement that you know, you'll, the town will pay something uh, and, and, and the utility district will take something less than the full value and it becomes town ownership, then everybody in town and the town plan, you can make those decisions. We're in a situation now, especially with the utility district, Skip just mentioned it, um, the, the new charter of the utility district has, leaves them with the authority to run a water and sewer system and to, and to make um, decisions with regard to property that they own. And really the decisions that they have are either we're going to continue to own them and, and do something that will ultimately benefit the utility district or we're going to dispose of it. They, they can't, I don't think it's in their um, authority any longer. They couldn't build a parking lot there if they wanted to now. They couldn't decide to lease the property to somebody to build something on it. They have very restricted powers compared to what they had before. And is it just residential customers on this utility that have voting rights? And do they have to be, yeah. does that have to be their, do they have, have to be to residents? Live in the, yeah, okay. yep. Same yeah, checklist as before. 
Yeah, so, so you know, Green Mountain Coffee Roasters or Ben & Jerry's doesn't get a vote. Sure. And even though you own property in the right. district, you don't live there anymore, so you don't get a vote. So, uh, I mean, the, the Ben & Jerry's and the Coffee Roasters wouldn't get a vote if, if the town owned it either. You know, it's, it's voters that are really where they're not where you own property. But that's the other option, is to figure out a way to transfer this property into ownership of the town, and then the town can study all of those kind of things and make some decisions. I think, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, commissioners, but I think this proposal stems out of the fact that the parking study was done. It indicates that there is a need for parking, and you're right, Jane, it said there's no real need right now and Mark said it segues into the next one, as long as the TD bank is there and available. But that's kind of in limbo now. So I think the commissioners are proposing this three-tenths of an acre be carved off, and whether the town wants to buy it and do something with it now to develop parking, or they'll just hold on to it until 10 years down the road, the town says, we really need parking. Lot, we'll buy it from you now and we'll develop it. Right? They're not going to develop it as a parking lot. I don't think they can. Right. That's, we can't spend the money to, to do that. So. so would you like to uh, discuss TD? Pardon? I said, would you like to discuss the TD Bank North um, issue? Well, I'm going to close the <laughs> utility commissioners because this item was me coming to you. Um, and it certainly is related, and Lefty and Cindy are welcome to stay in things. Um, living on Elm Street, I know pretty much what uh, parking is like downtown every day. Um, and there's a lot of, this summer was pretty busy, I would say. And I think we were pretty fortunate, TD Bank, let that parking lot continue to be used with almost no restrictions. And there were many nights that parking lot was full. Um, and I mean full. There's probably 15 more cars in there than there were sort of marked spaces. The fire lanes full, the drive-through was full, they were on the lawn and everything. So that TD Bank lot was more than used this summer. And if we were to lose it, I think, um, you know, these businesses would suffer. Um, one of the biggest uh, need of parking is the beer cellar store, too. Uh, living on Elm Street, there's some days there's, you know, out-of-state cars are the majority on there, and they're all going to the beer cellar and getting their beer and walking back and things. So it's not just the restaurants. And that Elm Street lot is full day in, day out with uh, people there. So, um, and I know I supported the select board looking into purchasing that when it happened. And uh, I mean, when it came up for sale, unfortunately, we we weren't able to do that. And this new owner, um, I've kind of heard he has property in Stowe or something, but then I heard, you know, the sign went back up in the bank parking lot. If you want to lease it, you call, you know, the TD bank folks. And I thought, well, maybe it's falling through. And then there was, uh, the new owner did his due diligence and did some contamination studies and things and found there is some contamination there from past uses. It, um, I've talked to the folks and the information is online. It's not too serious. They may have to remove some soils or it may be just a uh, posting in the land records that there is contamination there. So, Skip, is it a the prospective new owner, the property hasn't transferred yet. Uh, right. I'm it's going to ask that. It's, but the it's prospective really, owner yeah, did due diligence. Yeah. I just, yeah. And I, um, Alyssa has been in touch with them, and she can fill in kind of gaps. I haven't talked to anybody except the folks from the state and Alyssa. Um, but that I would, in, my point is, that's pretty important to the downtown, and I would encourage 
um, the select board to authorize Bill or direct him and maybe a member of the select board and RW to begin discussions with the new owner before he you know, does something and closes off the importance of the town. I don't think this is going to happen for free. Um, I know the parking study said we should get some agreement or arrangements even if it's just after hours parking. Um, I think you know, we should follow up with the Northfield Bank as well because that bank uh, parking lot after hours is pretty full and things. So um, I think stressing to this new owner, uh, you know, open up to the needs of uh, the importance of it and begin the discussion before he's got something that, oh no, um, we're going to close it off. and. Uh, and, uh, and it, Bill was right that we were looking at the future parking and before this is uh, sold off and in something else that's available. So um, I know, Alyssa, you can fill in any gaps I've left out about the uh, this future owner. I have never met him. I don't know who he is and uh, suggest maybe extending a Hello, all. Um, so Skip mentioned he was going to stop in. Um, I guess the information I have now to start with is that the property is currently and still owned by TD Bank. Um, it is hopefully in the process of being sold. The last information I had is that the closing, which was originally anticipated at the end of August, will now hopefully be at the end of this month. It's still in process. Um, I have talked with the prospective owner who's hoping to purchase it by that point. Um, the sign in the window is on that new potential owner's behalf. Anyone can call it. It links to VT Commercial out of Burlington. I have spoken with that real estate agent. Um, I guess I would say just the biggest, obviously as economic development director in town, I would love to find a great use for the community that supports the existing businesses, potential for new businesses, other community needs, all those types of things. Um, I'd say from the development and parking perspective, the biggest consideration is there is parking requirements for certain things. So like you saw from Steve's proposal, the swing from office use to restaurant requires really different amounts of parking. So obviously having what's currently configured as parking on your property um, allows flexibility in that if, oh, I need 15 spaces to get this permitted and they're sitting right there, that's easy to do. Um, I think Mark can probably speak to when you don't have the spaces um, on your property and you all have discretion over that now as the select board. But the point is just, the story I've heard is until they have confirmed the tenants, which we're working on and it's an ongoing process, but it's not done yet, particularly as they don't yet own the property. Um, I think they're hesitant to commit to anything until they know what their own needs would be for tenants. So that's all fairly vague, but that is the information I have at this point, and um, I certainly, yeah, that's And that is correct. I didn't mean that he would know what he wanted to do today, but just to be involved in the conversation and you know the importance of it and what might be worked out later on and stuff. So uh, that's what I wanted to stress. I know Lefty sees some of the parking on Elm Street. I don't know if you. Oh yeah. Every once in a while, you could buy some of these driveways blocked right off. Yeah. Well, the, the nice thing about that, it goes back to your earlier comment, 51 South Main is empty, and people are parking on top of each other yeah. one block away. It's like, okay. Uh, signage, um, and signs are only good for people that read, so um, that doesn't pertain to having a driver's license. Yeah. <laughs> and it wasn't like that while the bank still operated and things. I think people respected that. There was, I know a year ago, there was more use of 51. Right. I think there's a lot of, I mean, I looked at um, the TD Bank this morning at 10 o'clock when I walked back uh, by. 
And there were already 15 cars at 10 o'clock in the morning, and the restaurants weren't open. So yeah. it looks like employees have graduated, gradu gravitated back to parking yeah. there because the bank is no longer in business. So now, We're just fortunate the bank didn't drag some Jersey barriers in there and block it off. Yes. Uh, Custom. Well, I do, any immediate thoughts from the board members about all of this as a whole, as far as the municipal, uh, the water districts portion, um, TD Bank North? Um, I, I guess I, I would. I mean, I would say I agree with um, Mark, and then some comments from Bill kind of underlined it that. This could drag on for a long time with 51 South Main Street, and um, it's just a shame because you know we have a pretty vibrant downtown, and we need that space for a, you know both parking and some kind of useful, possibly mixed use apartments or whatever. It seems like you're kind of in a row because it's taken so long to. It's complicated, I understand, but. Yeah, I'll jump in. I'm going to recuse myself just because I feel like I'm too tied into this a little bit. So, this one. It's red. Um, can I borrow some of this? Bill's more comfortable with the dead mic anyway. I, I guess I, I'd say um, to conclude is I, I'd be interested if the town could figure out a way to buy this. Yeah, I don't. I don't know if we're going to have the opportunity to buy that parcel. I think. What are we talking about? Here? She's, you're talking about fifty. No, I'm talking about fifty-one cents. Oh, okay. Um, I think we're just we're wearing a new hat, and I think we're going to have to figure out as a select board parking. And I don't know, Steve. I know years ago, like right, right now, years ago, I, I've done it as a business. I wanted to make a modification. I would go to the DRB. They would typically never stop. I think Jane. A, a, a requested project and they would send you over to the trustees and as far as I know the trustees never said no due to parking it there was a blessing that happened and I think as we've grown as a downtown before I got here and even since I've been here I've seen the growth of downtown I think it's really good there's a ton of jobs that have been created from it I think it keeps the community strong but parking is Something that I think we've we've luckily been able to use a lot of private parking for for the municipal good, I guess you could say. Um, I know that my customers park in the TD Bank parking lot. I know my customers park behind the building next to me. Um, I'm in constant communication with that owner, whether or not I should be financially in su support of his parking lot. And part of me says, yeah, maybe. Um, I don't know what we need to do to address that concern. I, I have heard that he may turn it into just paid parking and maybe that's a solution that might force more people to go down to 51 if they know it's free, if those parking spaces are still available. Um, but that new owner, could, he's, he's a wealthy owner and he could, according to our rules, go lot line to lot line and only build parking required to support whatever he builds in the new, he or she builds in the new project. So that could just go away. And I think that we're, we're fortunate to have grown as much as we have with the use of that lot, but I don't know what we could do moving forward. I think an idea would be to reach out and say, if you're gonna go through the effort and cost of putting in arms and then have some kind of enforcement officer for your parking lot and the headaches surrounding I lost my ticket I lost whatever I don't know I think that's I don't know what that PL looks like but I think maybe we could if we're willing to as a select board take on that public private partnership of can we offer your lot up to the public as a public parking lot but you still own it and we're leasing it from you if there's a number that makes sense that they don't put the barricades in, they don't put in the pay stations, and we avoid having to go out and spend a significant amount of money on buying a lot, maybe having to pave it. I mean, that's a, that's a huge cost. I mean, we saw years ago it was $14,000 a parking space. So maybe there's a number that makes sense even financially to offer it up to a private landowner like the TD Bank owner and say, hey, 
here's what we'd be willing to pay as a town, or is there a number that you would be interested in that we could kind of preserve what how it's currently set up and avoid some of maybe that spillover into the residential neighborhoods around? I mean, I guess, I think the overarching thing too is that we just need to put parking on the list of to-dos. I think the police thing came up a couple of years ago, and now I think we have to really make sure that parking is a is a regular conversation on this board. So a couple things that I see being an issue, um, even if the piece of property that the water district offered up was purchased by the town. Best case scenario, uh, the way I, the way the parking um, spaces kind of number out here. Uh, if the reconstruction project goes through, we will basically wash what we're losing and what we're gaining. Correct. Yep. Somewhere within reason. Uh, they're saying 30 spaces on the, th on the yeah. <coughs> three acres or, or, uh, point zero, or 0 0.3 acres. And I think last count we were going to lose somewhere in that range, right? right? On Main Street? Yeah. Main Street. On, yeah. Street on Main Street. Yeah. yeah. Something in that. That's for the whole length of that. Yeah. Point nine miles. Right. Do you know what the downtown is? <laughs> I don't. <coughs> The other issue is, um, what's the public, the, what are the voters going to say when we, if, if this gets brought to them? Uh, what about the other businesses like Ari Fishman, you know, the Zen Barn, the Grange Hall that have all been through parking issues? Um, you know, how do you, how do you address an issue like that where we're helping some and not others? Uh, and then let alone the fact that the taxpayers have got to uh, get on board with just offering to purchase space here in the village to help businesses that aren't even theirs. You understand? And I know the importance of that, but not everybody's going to see that same thing. So there's some other issues here outside of just approaching the, the owner of TD and, and, you know, and swinging a deal with these guys if it were to go in that direction that uh, I could see happening here. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, it's going to be an uphill battle with, with all of this parking issue. Yeah, I guess I, I don't know how other towns have, have dealt with it. I know Montpelier got rid of the parking requirements for development, but they also have, I believe, some municipal parking too. Downtown Burlington has municipal parking garages as far as I know. So I think, I totally agree with you. I think it's it's gonna, it could be a hot button issue of people saying, you know, why why do I need to pay for that? And, and maybe there is a scenario that it could be an assessment on commercial, I mean, I'm, I'm about to say that maybe I should pay for it, but how do I like, how do we do it to make, I mean, there may, might be a scenario. I know my grandmother owned a piece of property in Naperville, Illinois, and they ended up putting some kind of assessment on all the properties and it helped pay for a parking garage. I'm not saying we build a parking garage, but maybe there is a scenario that levels that playing field a little bit. I will say that there are a lot of people that maybe don't have businesses downtown, but they support my business and other businesses and they have the same parking headaches and it could potentially be a lot worse with 50, I mean, uh, with TD especially, potentially going off the, the use grid. So I think some people would actually probably be understanding of that, especially if it's not highly impactful to them. I guess it would come down to what's the cost? And then we have that conversation. And I, and I, I totally agree with you on that. I think there is some balance that says that we also still just need a healthy, vibrant downtown. I, I moved here because I saw the growth happening. I decided to own a business because I saw the growth of the downtown. I think it's a really important part of us as a community and not only living here, but tourism as well. Um, yeah. uh, he has completed the Hubbard Farm large culvert replacement just before you get the Beauty Forgers. 
house now uh, that was completed uh, the first week I was away. Um, that's come in. Um, $60,000 price tag there. We did have a $40,000 grant. We're in the process of finalizing the paperwork with the state. We'll be so how many of those bigger stuffs are going to become consecutively year after year? Got the road's going to need to be done. Um, Loomis Hill is going to need to be done. Blush Hill is going to need to be done. Barnes Hill is going to need to be done. So you got big chunks of, of 800 to a million, somewhere in that range, year after year for the next five, six years. You know, so those are going to all start piling on top of each other. So instead of one 10 year payment, you're going to have six or seven 10 year payments all happening at the same time. So what are those numbers going to do for our municipal? Do we really plan on taking on all those projects in the next 10 years? I mean, that's why I made a statement know, a couple years ago about uh, just borrowing $25 million and deal with the whole thing and get it over with. I mean, we're going to be at that point once we start overlapping these payments. But I think the, the idea of overlapping is that you're spreading out and you're, you're allowing the roads to, because they're all not going to age at the same rate. And if you, if you do one re-up like that, I don't know if that really gets you that much farther ahead. I don't. I think some of these roads do have years ahead of them. I think that that would be not financially responsible to just pull the trigger and do it right away. Have you been up Barnes Hill lately, all the way to the top Maple Street, and uh, yeah, take a ride up there? I've been up. I've been up Loomis, and I agree that that road needs to be yeah. done. And I'm sure there's other roads in similar. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So condition, but. Those are all going to pile on top of you at some point in your municipal tax rate because of it. Right. It's, so it's the, go where. the suggestion that I'm saying go, is, is that we go. we consider this project mostly for a potential tax roll move that gets more income and hopefully ties up money for the shortest amount of time and we recover as much as possible. That's my whole idea behind the 51 South Main Street decision or, or idea that I'm putting forward. I, I totally agree with you that we also have to look at those costs moving forward, but if, if this project just gets kicked down for five more years from the utility district, we've gained nothing. I get not, it. Not to say that we have this derelict, you know, the building is going to, it's not derelict, but it's a useless, useless property. It's a, it's a waste for our downtown, which is better than that. We have, you know, all kinds of interest and, in, in, um, Activity in our downtown to have this land sit idle is so not to, to, to Mark's point. I mean, if you spend two hundred thousand dollars and you financed it with a, a five year note, right? So that's what forty thousand dollars a year times half a cent, right? Forty thousand dollars a year, and then if it's five percent, then five percent of forty thousand is um, another two thousand. Yeah. So it's forty four thousand dollars a year. So it's a penny, right? In five years you would pay back two hundred thousand dollars plus a few pennies of interest and you'd be done with it. And if somebody developed a, a three and a half million dollar project on there, they would be they would be paying $15,750 a year in municipal taxes. So the, for five years, your net, your net expense is going to be 44000 and that's going to decline. The interest will decline. You're going to spend $44,000. you are got to take in almost $16,000. But so that's if you were going to give it to them for free, but we're not saying give it to them for free. No, I'm, right? I'm just saying just the $200,000. I know you're not going to yeah. give it to them for free. So You'd, you'd, you'd sell it, but just on the raw numbers, even if you were going to give it to them for free, right. in six or seven years, you'd be ahead. Right. Because you're going to be getting that $15,000, $16,000 of taxes a year forever, and your payment to pay that $200,000 is going to go away after five years. 
And if you sold it to them, if you spent 200 and then you flipped it and you sold it for 165, your 35,000, you wouldn't even have to borrow that. So, you know, but, it's not a losing proposition. The, but, the losing yeah. proposition is to leave it sitting the way it is, doing absolutely nothing, and and people can't even find I it for agree with you. That's well, based on 200,000. But they're asking 260, almost 270. Well, you're, you're no, no, they're not asking. No, you're t the, the appraisal that you show here shows, shows 264. That's, that's two, all 260. that. They just got that from That's me. what Dan Sweet yeah. said, that those parcels would be worth if they were independent parcels. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I mean, do you know. think they would take 200,000? I think they You seem to would. imply that tonight. That's partially okay. why I'm bringing, I, I brought it up. Would. Well, then they'd be done Could, with the headache. Now, yep. here's a question. Can we put an RFP out even if we don't own it? Could we actually set up the deal before we were to ever consider the movement of any money? Uh, we'd have we to have, you'd have to have a purchase and sales. Why do we go back to place. Chris Parsons? I mean, I don't know if anyone would. Well, I mean, for example, if we put an RFP out and Chris Parsons or someone like him put a, I mean, I think the idea of somebody spending too much money on a proposal if we don't even own it, but I don't. It's just a question. Well, we've already seen a proposal for the project that yeah, seems. I, I don't know the yeah. answer. Maybe you could could you negotiate with somebody who'd already put a proposal in? It seemed like it had a lot of promise. We'd have to do we'd have to do an independent RFP on our own once yeah once we had the property. But uh, for right now, I wouldn't expend a whole lot of energy trying to seek out RFPs when we don't yeah, even have Well, it's just, I mean, the, 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 the scary scenario that, is we that, buy it and, and no one wants it, right? 200 to 500. Or, or we buy it and Chris Parsons isn't there anymore and we don't get the $3.5 yeah. million dollar billion. So, like, those are the scary. So I was wondering if you could actually, like, I don't know, what, like, talk <laughs> through. You know, who knows? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think you could talk. I think you could talk to anybody. Yeah. I'm not sure. An RFP would be the right way, but if you wanted to talk to a developer, mm -hmm. we'll leave their names out of it. If you wanted to talk to a developer and say we're interested in a public-private partnership, we'd like to, you know, pursue buying a parcel and then selling it to you and negotiating parking, you know, that's kind of the where the public element comes in. I think you could do that and talk to him about it. You wouldn't be able to. I don't think you could sign any kind of binding right. contract. Sure, you sure, I understand that. Owning, but I think you could talk to a developer about that and say we have a need for parking, and we we have an idea of a parcel that might be available, and so on and so forth. So I think you could have that conversation in advance. A little yeah. while ago, when I said you have to get it through the public twice, is you're going to have to get the town to agree to. Buy it, and you're going to have the EFUD district have to agree to sell it. Right? Yeah, so maybe our economic development director meetings. might be well, interested and, in that conversation. And, uh, the mess that went on when they had uh, Dan's project um, with the the public information stuff and everything else, and everybody was in an uproar over it and scuttled that project. And that's the same prospect that we're looking to take on. I. I partially disagree with that because they didn't have to go out to public vote. Yes. Well, they, they, you don't have to. They, they can sell the parcel. They can enter into a purchase and sale agreement with anybody right now. The, the, the pitch is that if they sold it without allowing the public to vote, the, the voters in the district can petition uh, village meeting or a, a district meeting to negate the offer. So why, why? Uh, Is that a similar scenario invite, if it were in our? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Why, why invite the public's eye right. if, if they have sure. the ability yeah. to turn it down? And I'm not saying we try to do anything that the public's not in support <laughs> of, but I didn't hear a lot of people's because the Chris Parson project was pretty, I mean, I, I know I keep referring to that, but that's the most recent RFP that I know that really went public. I mean, I didn't hear a lot of, I felt like that one was addressing more of the concerns of neighbors and community yeah, folks. I, mean, I think the people that saw the presentation was pretty well uh, satisfied with it. I think, you know, um, Johnson's proposal was a very- right. Fill the air rights and- 
yeah. and you know it, it went to the maximum as far as the height mm -hmm. and everything else and the public just didn't like it and Chris's idea was a little bit more in keeping with what's there now. Yeah. So. Ann, you wanted to say something? Yeah, I, I agree with what Lefty said about nobody using 51 set, but that's only been within the last month. During the summer, practically every day, a lot was at least half, and then after 5 o'clock, it would frequently be full three quarters, and on weekends, it was constantly filled. And people would walk between my house to get, you know, over to the restaurants, you know, go past the fire station and the restaurant. So 51 is, was being used, and I think maybe it's because everybody's gone back to school or, or something, but as soon as fall foliage hits, <laughs> that'll fill up again. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, you know, it has been useful as far as parking goes. I still think one of your biggest uphill climbs is going to be getting the voters on board with a purchase well, to, for, for the purpose, you know. I, I have to think that a lot of people, you know, it's been seven years since Irene. Yep. I think a lot of people want to see something happen in that lot and something yeah. positive. It's a waste. I, I support you. I support you what you're saying, Bill. I think we should the, the town should try to buy this slot and flip it and have some control and come up with an attractive project. I, I wouldn't present it if I didn't think that there was a financially responsible decision behind it. And I think that's where I think that would need to be in the forefront of laying out exactly why we would even consider yeah. it and the, fi the financial model behind it and why we think it makes sense to the community. I think, I think a lot of people would be scared when you say, let's go spend 200000 but if you lay out why and we can get to a scenario where it's ten or $15,000 per year that comes back to the community because of that, and we might have to eat some of that up front to gain it in the back end. I think a lot of people would understand that and, and, and be in support of it. Plus, yeah. uh, plus assuring that you would have municipal parking going forward. If you could put out a logic, logical platform in front of the voters, you might get... Can I get your support? ...to bite on it. <laughs> <laughs> if it's there, you would. <laughs> sure. So what would be some next steps? I think we can all just sit on it for... Uh, what's our next yeah. meeting? I mean, I don't think we need to make any decisions tonight. Yeah, I, I don't think you should make a decision. Next meeting. I'll make a motion to adjourn. No, no, no. Never mind. <laughs> Table motion <bed>. denied. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the first time I've been denied the motion. <laughs> um, the, last, the last item on the agenda for me is to present this traffic signal maintenance agreement between the state agency of transportation and the town of Waterbury for. Waterbury FEGC F013-413, otherwise known as the Main Street Project. So um, in order for them to go out to bid, as Jane suggested, um, there's a maintenance agreement. Um, and <clears throat> what this maintenance agreement basically says is that um, beginning at uh, 0.062 miles east of the roundabout, so where the Main Street project starts, mm -hmm. to a distance of 0.968 miles to the other end, um, the, the state will oversee the installation um, through this contract of a number of uh, traffic signal devices and signs. So there'll be the traffic light at Park Row, the traffic light at Bank Hill, and then all the signs, which will be to the most up-to-date MUTCD standards. Um, and this maintenance agreement says that the town will agree to maintain those facilities once they're built going forward. Now, when the traffic lights were initially put in back in the early to mid-80s, um, the select board worked out an agreement, or maybe it was the trustees, it was before I was here, so I don't remember. But um, 
the state maintain the traffic lights. They were responsible for it. And um, over the last couple of years, we have taken over more and more responsibility to it. We still deal with the state folks who do the maintenance. But once this project is done, they, they want to say, you know, we're done with it. And if you don't agree, I mean, part of the agreement is that you'll maintain the signs and that you'll keep them up to the, the standard MUTCD <coughs> standards. And uh, if you take any sign down without first getting the permission of VTrans and Federal Highway, you have to pay them back for the sign. And for the most part, if you ask them permission, they would say, no, you can't take it down because by the standards, you need to have the signs that they're putting up. Mm -hmm. So anyway, it's, um, it's pro forma, I think. I, I've read it. There's nothing in here that concerns me. So I would ask somebody to make a motion to authorize me to sign this on behalf of the town. Yeah, I was going to ask you if it was an author. Is it a motion to authorize to sign or a motion to approve? So it's a motion to authorize to sign then. So moved. I'll second that. By authorizing me to sign it, you're approving it too. Uh, I did have a question. Um, the hell was it? Uh, right along there. I was going to ask it, but I forget. Um, hmm. No. Okay. All those in favor, then? Aye. 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 <laughs> I'll make a motion. motion there. I'll make a motion to adjourn. Now you've got it. Yes. Second? Second. I'll second. Okay. <laughs>